what a Kanzuk space agency would look like. What is Kanzuk? Simply put, it's a close reliance between the countries Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. The idea here is that these four nations share so many similarities that other nations cannot match that their close reliance would have few negative outcomes for their citizens and many positives. This is usually and notably cited as economically in negotiations with powers such as China and the United States, whilst military collaboration is already extremely high. With economic and military cooperation at the heart of the issue, there's no surprise that there is scope for significant impact to the global space economy by interfering with the operations of these four intrepid global leaders. Why bother to amalgamate the space agencies? The primary function of the space agencies is to create a policy environment which is most closely aligned to the needs of each nation. As discussed, these four countries are perhaps the most closely aligned in the world, which provides direction benefits over membership of a larger corporation such as ESA. There are other difficulties associated with being a small part of a large organisation such as the European Space Agency too. The UK provides a large portion of the funding for ESA, including for the Human Spaceflight Programme. However, the competitive selection of astronauts spans 22 member states and selects UK candidates infrequently. ESA has included a total of 30 astronauts over its history, of which only one has been a UK citizen. That's 3.3% versus the 9.2% overall ESA budget contribution by the UK. Benefits of increased autonomy beyond Kanzuk may appear favourable. The Canadian Astronaut Corps has trained 14 out of 14 Canadian astronauts after all. However, there is strength in cooperation. In order for Canada to invest so heavily in human spaceflight, they've had to save in other areas. Despite being leaders in robotic equipment for use in space, the nation has never built a robotic explorer for the Moon, Mars or any other celestial body. Whilst the UK was able to fund that before investing in human spaceflight through ESA. Taking an option of Kansas Space Agency membership does not preclude continued membership of ESA or bilateral agreements with any other spacefaring nations such as Japan. It simply presents a new tranche of opportunities for the four nations to consider and with such closely aligned political and cultural views, it's highly likely that Kanzuk could pursue missions that would never get the funding required through other major space contenders. How will Kanzuk Space Agency be funded? The UK would contribute the most gross funding with proven ability to overspend on single projects of national importance. The UK massively dominates the annual budget in US dollars and that's before you take into account single-use projects such as the OneWeb purchase. But this doesn't tell the whole story. The Australian government has chosen to play it very safe on space spending and whilst they support industry to make significant moves into the space market, the national agency itself wields only a very small $9.8 million budget. Even with this apparent underspend, a Kansas space agency could expect to marshal the resources of just under $1 billion US dollars without a UK top-up on major projects such as OneWeb. If Australia could be encouraged to match the average percentage GDP spent by the other three nations on space, 0.016%, the budget would increase to almost $1.2 billion. Whilst this may be small fry in capital spending compared with ESA at $4.5 billion, NASA at 27.5, or Roscommerce at 2.1, there are a number of major benefits that each nation could derive that are not currently available to all. Expert in space policy James Bennett, who has advised the US and UK governments on how to create policy for commercial spaceflight and has worked on numerous high-profile projects towards the commercialisation of space in the USA, believes the four nations are well poised to join forces now and share resources, benefiting from areas that individual nations currently excel in and reprioritising funding to cover any capability gaps that he says could be identified in a simple matrix. In truth, the matrix may be too simple. It should probably include propulsion systems, navigation, communications and more. But already it's possible to see general categories of capability that are over or underdeveloped within Kanzuk. Context is also, of course, key to the decision-making processes. Whilst the UK can tick the robotic exploration box with the mixed success of the Beagle 2, which landed successfully on Mars, Canada's MDA is a world leader within space robotics. Even so, perhaps only juggernaut contracting companies such as Rolls-Royce and BAE Systems are the realistic most likely hopes for integrated systems for space exploration, because the space policy environment within Kansas nations is predominantly geared towards commercial space activity, rather than the more traditional national space activities enabled by the USA's policy background 
through the space race era. Kansuk Space Agency, is it a space power or a space enabler? James Bennett was instrumental in paving the way for commercial space flight in the United States before he became a government advisor to the United Kingdom government in achieving that same milestone, which is going through parliamentary process now. Space would be a good topic for Kanzuk early on, he says. There are some good capabilities there. The argument for a space agency-led mission program will always remain a powerful one in the scientific sphere, where there are less immediately obvious commercial benefits to be had. That being said, SpaceX fever proves that the market today is highly preferential to distant speculation when it comes to gaining a slice of the future Martian economy. NASA's commercial launch and commercial crew programs prove that there's a great deal of value to be had by enabling companies, small and large, to participate in the space industry competitively and to buy services rather than mission assets directly. Most space agencies today, including NASA, persist in capital asset creation, while SpaceX, Blue Origin and ULA are all pumping out new and improved rocket designs capable of placing large payloads into orbit, NASA forge ahead with the unpopular SLS program, which will probably come to market after, be less capable and more expensive than their commercial competitors. Whilst ESA isn't developing an in-house launch capability as too expensive an endeavour, the UK Space Agency, with a budget approximately 20% of ESA's, has subsidised at least seven launch options which are currently in development by private companies. Skyrora, Orbex, B2 Space, Black Arrow Space Technologies, SmallSpark Space Systems, Reaction Engines and Raptor Aerospace form the most famous of UK rocket launch companies, whilst other contenders are not out of the race, Star Chaser Industries, for example. In some cases, rocket launch companies include an embedded launch site operator. Black Arrow Space Technologies is closely tied with Horizon Spaceport, who are developing their sea launch capability around the Black Arrow design. This ship, using a SpaceX reminiscent witty naming convention, Space Ship, other UK launch facilities are not tied to a single rocket variant, as Skyrora and Orbex are expected to share the same site, and American prime contractor Lockheed Martin plan to fly ABL-manufactured rockets from Shetland Space Centre. All of this capability building is extremely positive. However, Lockheed, Skyrora and Orbex are all targeting polar orbits from northern Scotland. Indeed, New Zealand, Australia and Canada also have sites which target these same orbits. However, the most common launch profile for a launch to space, be that for interplanetary or orbital missions, is one targeting an equatorial orbit round and round the planet's equator, rather than over and over the planet's poles. It's important to forecast what the space economy of the future is going to use space for, in order to see where the market will generate growth for launch companies. Polar orbits are really useful for satellites that need to point at the Earth and cover every square inch or centimetre of the surface. That could be for weather satellites, mapping, communications or super-secret spy activity. These four categories are vastly the most popular type of satellite launch at the moment, with great thanks to constellations such as Starlink, OneWeb, and Earth observation companies such as Planet's group of superdoves, which are imaging the Earth at an ever-increasing rate. For the sake of clarity, a large number of communication satellites maintain a geostationary orbit, which is a type of equatorial profile. Anyone with sky television is benefiting from these, with a dish antenna on the house that only ever has to point at one spot in the sky. Indeed, many applications benefit from a broadcast to many solutions. However, the incidence of these geosatellites versus constellations of LEO or MEO satellites is decreasing, and one of the reasons is how expensive they are. This expense drove a lot of value to move to submarine fibre cables, and LEO constellations are bringing that value back into the space economy. It's expected that SpaceX's Starlink will generate over $3 billion in revenue a year, won back from fibre. Elon Musk predicts over $30 billion. Euroconsult published a report, Satellites to be Built and Launched by 2028, which does a good job of covering the topic. Broadly though, it's clear that constellations close to the Earth are where the money will be found for commercial launch in the next few years, which sit predominantly in a polar orbit. That's good news for Kanzuk launch sites and operators. But what does the next horizon look like? Industry experts believe that all eyes will be on Mars for the next 10 years of space exploration with some smaller missions going to the outer planets of the solar system. Indeed, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on with regards to designing tiny submarines to sound the depths of Titan, vying for the chance to win some funding. 
space exploration pretty much exclusively calls for launches to equatorial profiles, Cape Canaveral style, because it lends a helpful boost to the rocket through the Earth's rotation. Kanzuk is developing a lot of launch capability which covers the immediate future, and indeed most of these launch companies with sites that favour a polar orbit do advertise launches to a low inclination profile which is closer to the equator, but the cost per kilogram goes up because it's much less efficient. Even the mighty USA slash New Zealand company Rocket Lab, who famously announced the development of their neutron rocket earlier this year, admit their payload to orbit reduces for an equatorial launch from 8,000 kilograms a little bit. Australia might be the best Kanzuk, indeed the best global example, of an enabling space agency over an enterprising one. The Australian Space Agency operates from a tiny budget of just under $10 million per year, but they get a lot of bang for their buck. Gilmore Space Technologies is a Queensland-based startup which has attracted a significant chunk of venture capital and aims to launch rockets from northern Australia. That's important for a couple of reasons. Equatorial orbits are efficient from here, and this is a southern hemisphere vertically integrated launch company that's moving through rocket and satellite design, engineering and operations. Australia also hosts two celebrated radio telescopes, the Parkes Observatory, which has been used for interplanetary communications above its usual astronomy role, and the still under construction Square Kilometre Array Telescope. This impressive future array telescope is being constructed in sites across South Africa and Australia, and it will be the largest and most powerful telescope of any kind ever created by mankind by an order of magnitude. You cannot overestimate the importance of this facility to the future of human space exploration. This isn't the only instance of shared access that would add real value to the experiment. The UK is a founding member of ESA, and just as one of the core selling points for the wider Kansas Alliance is the UK permanent member status as a founder of the UN Security Council, so too it, can it provide access to ESA missions and policy decisions. We've already discussed the parallel Canadian and UK astronaut corps, and an amalgamation of the four nations could provide additional funding to an existing experience training program, which uses facilities across the globe at Johnson Space Centre run by NASA, as well as facilities in Japan and Russia too. And of course, Canada is also a founding member of the ISS project. What should the mission focus of a Kansas Space Agency be? Quite literally, the billion dollar question. Opinions are divided. Many experts, such as David Whitehouse, acclaimed author of Space 2069, After Apollo, Back to the Moon, to Mars and Beyond, firmly believe that all spacefaring nations should have their eyes firmly fixed on the Red Planet as the main target of exploration for the next 10 years. It is perhaps a given that NASA, ESA, Roscosmos, CSA and JAXA will all be strongly focused in this direction. This could allow Kanzuk to be a major player in funding missions outside of Mars exploration. Major space agencies are developing mission ideas for the outer solar system Exploring the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are both popular mission ideas, but Kanzuk is likely to be a more commercially friendly policy framework. It might be possible to see the Kanzuk nations looking to lead the way on enabling commercial exploitation of space rather than the pure scientific exploration of Mars or the Jovian moons. Kanzuk could focus mission attention on the further rapid commercialization of Earth orbits beyond low Earth orbit. We could look at O'Neill cylinders as a concept that's preferred by James Bennett and others seeking to populate space with low communication latency and a 1G environment. It could focus on developing the technologies required to truly explore and commercialise the asteroid belt or harness the power of the sun for commercial gain. The possibilities are endless, but the UK has shown an ability in the past to depart from main paradigm of space policy by defunding human spaceflight for a number of years. It is not impossible for a further bold stroke to be proposed in the Kansuk sphere to raise the profile and associated economic benefits of membership of a joint space agency. The space industry has always benefited from migration of talent between businesses and nations. Indeed, the jewel in the crown of the early USA manned spaceflight program, Werner von Braun, was a German engineer who relocated at the end of the Second World War. So the freedom of movement key aim of Kanzuk certainly works with the idea of a new and successful Kanzuk Space Agency agenda too. 
So does free trade, the second of three major policy points behind Kansak International. The USA maintains very strong anti-proliferation rules which govern the way that space technologies can be shared outside of that country. Indeed, until 2020, not even their closest ally, the UK, was allowed to import US space tech for commercial enterprises known as ITAR. Finally, but at the forefront of the ideas behind the Kansas Space Agency, is foreign policy cooperation. Just as all of these countries participate in NATO operations and deployments, they could, and arguably should, find a large-scale civilian organisation to inspire their students and to project their influence far and wide across the globe in a peaceful and responsible way. Founder and CEO of Kansas International, James Skinner, said, these three objectives are essentially what define Kanzuk and make it stand out in comparison to other diplomatic arrangements around the world. There are plenty of challenges for Kanzuk to overcome to make the space agency well balanced in capabilities, funding and mission objectives. But if they can be overcome, the opportunity here is one of the biggest for these nations in decades and could really help to place these four nations at the forefront of one of the world's fastest growing industries. You have been listening to a giant hyphen leap space article. Why not join the conversation over on patreon.com forward slash giant leap?